First up, if you were yes. dared, if you were, <laughs> if you were dared to have a karaoke battle singing Christmas carols against Peter Billingsley and the rest of the cast, would you take the dare or would you pass? Welcome back to Talking a Christmas Story, your go-to place for all things related to our beloved holiday classic. I'm your host, Yano Anaya, and today we've got a special treat for all you fans out there. But before we dive into this exclusive interview with Scotty Schwartz, who you know played the unforgettable flick, let's take a moment to explore some of the rich themes and fascinating trivia about A Christmas Story that continues to endear it to audiences across generations. The quest for the perfect Christmas presents, the trials and tribulations of the Parker family, and of course, the unforgettable dare that left Flick's tongue stuck to that frozen flagpole. These moments aren't just entertaining, they're a mirror to joy, anticipation, and sometimes letdowns that come with the holiday seasons. It's these universally relatable themes that make a Christmas story, not just a film, but a yearly tradition for many of us. Did you know that much of the film's charms comes from authenticity? Many of the on-screen antics were inspired by real childhood experiences of Gene Shepard, the narrator and author of the book, which you know the movie is based on. This blending of reality and whimsical storytelling is what breathes life into the streets of Hammond, Indiana making every watch a trip down memory lane for many. Thank you to Bob Clark. And who could forget the scene that brought the perils of peer pressure to a freezing point? Flick's encounter with the flagpole is a testament to the film's ability to blend humor with lessons that resonate with us long after the credits roll. It's these moments that remind us of the innocence and boldness of childhood where every dare is a test of bravery and every challenge is an adventure. Over the years, the Christmas story has embedded itself into the fabric of holiday pop culture, influencing countless other works and sparking traditions like the 24 hour marathon. Its impact is a testament to the timeless appeal of its story and characters, proving that the magic of the holidays can indeed be captured on film. And speaking of special connections to a Christmas story, I've got a little revelation that might just surprise you. So n no, no one knows this and I, I hate to spill the beans, but we have a secret society more rare than the Little Orphan Annie community with a handful of members. This group enjoys a level of exclusive access to the cast and other incredible things related to a Christmas story that you simply can't get anywhere else. Now, why am I telling you this? Because today we've got something a little special. We've gathered some questions um, from this ultra exclusive community and from our broader Christmas Story family community. These aren't your everyday inquiries. They come from a place of deep appreciation and curiosity about the film and the people who brought it to life. So let's start there. Sharing these insightful questions with our guests today, Scott Schwartz, trust me, you're going to want to hear this. You're going to want to hear all of his answers. Without further ado, let's welcome our esteemed guest, Scott Schwartz, better known to all of us as the brave, if not a little bit foolheartedly, Flick. What's up, Scotty? How you doing, my brother? What's, it's been a while. What's up, what's big, you know? what's going on? Been a few days. Yeah, it's been a few days. You been busy? Been a few days. Yeah. Always. Yeah. So, Scotty, um, welcome to uh, the Talking with the Christmas Story cast. This is, like, super exciting for all of the fans that have been anticipating you coming onto the show. I know there's a couple of fans that have been waiting um, to ask you some questions. So I just want to kind of dive right into this so that um, you can go on about your daily life and handle business, right? So, oh, it's all, all right. good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Um, so, Scotty, uh, this question is from our community. Actually, all these questions are from the free group in our community. Um, and so this question is for you that they want to hear uh, is, Scotty, moving beyond the Christmas story, the fans would love to explore a bit more about you. 
You've had quite the journey since the movie's release. Can you share with us how the experience of being foot influenced your path after the movie? Uh, I don't know if you could say influenced. You know, it was just something that, uh, it was just a job that I did. I mean, I did many other jobs, you know. Um, it, it really doesn't come to fruition or become a big deal until what 14 years later you know i mean all throughout uh, the rest of the 80s and through the up to mid 90s i mean you know i was the kid from the toy i mean that's really what it was so the the more influence in my life was more richard Pryor, you know uh you know him being my mentor and my muse and my teacher and and my informational place to go when I had a question I needed answered. Um, I mean, a Christmas story doesn't come until 97 and 98. It really starts building momentum. Um, but it became the second generation. It became the, the, the people that were our age hitting their 20s, having seen it on cable or VHS, and then their kids starting to see it you know, that's when it, it became, uh, I want to show this to my kids. I've shown it to my son. I've shown it to my grandfather, you know. Uh, but it, it didn't really, doesn't really impact your life. I don't think, kind of think the way maybe fans think it does. You know, uh, getting the bronze statue in Hammond, Indiana. Yes, I mean, it's a wonderful thing. It's, you know, one of 30 that exist in the world and all those wonderful things. But, you know, I, I kind of say it the way that it is. And it's funny because I'm wearing my shirt. <laughs> friends don't let friends drink Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts. Because I use the example that, you know, it's great having a statue. It's 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 an honor. There's no question. Uh, at the same time, I walk into Dunkin' Donuts and coffee and a donut is still five bucks. You know, so in that way, it doesn't. But it's more... The invitations to dinners that you get when you go uh, and you travel and you go literally all over the country, you know, or North America, uh, where people just, they feel they know us. They know me. They know you. They know yeah. Peter and Zach and Ian. And, and they invite you to dinner. They invite you into their home. That You got to meet their mom. You got to meet their dad, their grandma, their grandpa, their aunt, their uncle, their brother, uh, sister. It's, that's really the differences. It just there's just so many uh, fans and people out there that because they grew up with us, that it's like we're a member of the family that they never get to meet. Yeah. I can resonate with that with a hundred percent. It's happened so many times in, in our experience of going on events is going into somebody's home. Like remember Joe Levy. I can remember. I remember that, that one time where we went into his home and he was just in awe that the Christmas story cast was in his home you know, eating his cookies. So yeah, I, that is, that's an amazing experience that people can have. You know, I mean, I've gone, at. you know, uh, to people that I've met somewhere along the way, maybe more than once or twice, you know, um, and they invite you into their home or their apartment or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and it, to them, it's surreal because they see us on television. Yeah. You know, so it's like they see us on TV. So we're not real people. Right. You know, we're just those guys. Right. You know, we're, yeah. we're those guys that's on TV. And they're, you would never think that we would come into their home, like, you know, you said with Joe. And I mean, I mean, and then there's yet the people that we know, you know, since either before or after, you know, I, I'll give the example my friend Scott, who you met, he was with Peter oh, yeah. for the Love events. <laughs> you know, it's like I have Scott's combination to his house. Right. I just go and I go, dude, what's up? And I take off my shoes and we sit and we yippity yap about whatever's going on. You know? Um, and I mean, that's Jersey. He's my, Jer you know, Miniger's my Jersey boy. So it's like, okay, fine. But I mean, I have other friends and places that I go to. Uh, and, and it's kind of the same thing. They just, they, they may have started out as fans, not the ones that we grew up with, you know, but other people may have started out as fans and then you become friends with them, you know? Jerry Lawler, you know, yeah. who you find you got to meet, you know, yeah. um, I mean, he's famous into his own right. Right. And yet he's a Christmas story lover. And it's like, you know, 
when are you coming back over? Whatever. And I have the combination to his house and it's like, okay, fine. And, you know, I spoke to him yesterday and, you know, it's like fans are everywhere. Yeah. You know, if you're in show business and it's, it's just the kind of person you are, you know, some people are more warm than others and, you yeah, know, that's true. some are cooler than others and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, Mindy says hi, by the way. Mindy from, from Florida. What's up, Mindy? Uh, hi, Mindy. What was her last name again? Do you remember? Strickland? M Mindy Strickland. Go Marines! I'm right, that's, she's a Marine. That's I'm pretty remember. sure. Yeah. Oh, my God. You're going to make me look now. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. It's Mindy, because she... No, she... Yeah, Mindy Strickland. Yeah, because she sent me a text this morning. All right, she's all like, right. hey, what's up? How are you? Aww, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I got, you know, I went down and... and we met in Cleveland and everybody, and then it was like, come and come down to Florida. You're coming down, hang out. And so we did, and, and she's wonderful. So it's like you get to meet good, mostly good people along the way. And, you know, it's – there's so much negativity in the world and badness yeah. in the world. And why not give somebody a smile? Yeah. You know? And and I went to see a friend of mine today, as a matter of fact. I, I won't mention her name. So now, um, next question. So Scott, um, looking back, how has been a part of such an iconic film um, changed your perspective on life or added to your perspective on life and your career choices moving forward? You know, uh, I've always just kind of put it in, Richard taught me this. It was, again, Pryor, it's just right, Richard the Pryor. teachings of Richard, you know. Yes. The job is the job. Life is life. They are two different things, you know. And you're never bigger than the job, and yet the job is not bigger than you, you know. You, you have to sort of understand that no matter what you do, when you walk through the door at home, you're, you're just you. You know, I never, I, I never let uh, doing two iconic films change my perspectives. You know, there were other things in my life that changed my perspectives along the way, especially Richard. You know, he kind of gave me a guidance uh, about life itself, you know, but you know, I will always be that kid from Bridgewater, New Jersey, no matter where I go, what I do, however old I get, or no matter where I live, I will always be that guy. I've had about the wildest, wackiest career of, of you know, of any of you guys by far. Um, I've had the good and I've had the bad, you know, uh, over the course of, of the career. Um, I don't say life because you got a kid and I don't, so... Darn, I missed out on that, Grandpa. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, I, I've always just been... I've kept my head straight on the ball. You know, you don't get lost in who you think you are. You know, so I mean... I mean, listen, I'm not saying it's not wonderful. It's great to be known for something that brings smiles and love and, and, and wonderful uh, feelings to people, yeah. you know, to be honored with a statue and, uh, to, you know, being on a monopoly board and an action figure and all these wild, wacky wild, things that I yeah. never thought, never. you know, you, cause you don't think about that stuff, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, we make the movie in 83 and it's a small little movie and okay, fine. And whatever. And there's no product for damn near 20 years. You know, there's not anything, you know, other than a leg lamp, but that's not us, yeah. you know. Um, I think that, I think the first Monopoly is like 08. I mean, you're talking 25 years after a movie is made. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's not like, oh, we're Star Wars and we're going to have toys and dolls right. and games. No. Right. Yeah. You know, none of us expected any of that stuff. Mm. You know, yeah. um, but it's... Again, it, it's it's forged different paths for each of us, you know. I mean, in my case, I mean, I'm sitting here, and and I mean, I could 
I can tell the people this is actually the week of WrestleMania. They probably won't see it till after that, but that's okay. Right. You know, and over on this side is my shot of the, the mega powers of, of Randy Savage and, uh, and Hulk Hogan. And over here is, is one of the most famous portrait photos of the lovely Miss Elizabeth, who was Randy's wife. If people don't know wrestling, that's okay. Right. Um, <laughs> but they were my friends. Yeah. You know, and these actually came from the offices of what used to be WWF back in the day. The photographer actually gave me his originals. Wow. You know, and, and, and him and his wife and his family, Christmas Story fanatics. Right. Again, I met him after Christmas Story, yeah. but nobody knew what it was. It was, you know, oh, my God, he's the guy Richard Pryor. That's so cool. You know, so, I mean, all this other stuff came later. But um, to say it. At, at not only my age, but our ages, to just have this thing that people love and people embraced, and they just, it brings a good feeling, you know. Uh, how did, there's an old saying by, by Wonka from, from Gene Wilder's movie, from Willy Wonka, and I'm just not thinking of it, but it's about the dreary world and you know, we should have a smile and a good thing. Something like that. I don't remember it. I have to remember it, you know. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a roller coaster. It's been a wild ride, you know? that's for sure. This it's been good. a wild ride, but, but, you know, we, I, I want to say we reap the benefits. It may not necessarily be the financial benefits of it, mm -hmm. but it's the fun things we get to do. Yeah. That's for sure. You know, Man, the places, is, the I, people. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good segue into this next question. So this next question is, would you uh, and can you share a moment or experience from your life that, although not related to the film, has been significantly shaped by the values or lessons that you've learned during your time as Flick? Not really. It was prior. You know, I mean, it was like the toy, because that was like you. You were well. Yeah, I mean, you know, like it's a big part of your life. You know, what I mean, and that's rare for yeah, anybody to you know. say. You know what I mean? I mean, most people don't even know that you had that kind of relationship with with Richard Pryor. I mean, he was a, an extremely famous individual at that time, and you were just a, you were what thirteen when you did the toy. Mm -hmm. I turned fourteen while we shot. Uh -huh. You know. That is yeah. a lot. I mean, a lot of the stories I just can't tell because it's a kid friendly show, oh, but sure. Um, <laughs> so maybe we'll keep that. But one the he, <laughs> we met, we talked, I had a background that I loved Hollywood to begin with. You know, I gone to the movies with dad every Saturday and not just one movie. We would go all day long from literally nine thirty, ten o'clock in the morning until after midnight. Yeah. We would be at a double feature on 42nd Street, seeing a kung fu picture and a horror movie. We would be at a film club called Joe's Place, right inside the Lincoln Tunnel in, in Manhattan. We would go to Town Hall, which was right off Broadway in 45th. Um, you know, so I knew a lot about old Hollywood and I knew about comedy and I knew who Richard was. So when I met him, we had discussions about things that your normal, typical 13-year-old would have no idea. You know, there was a, a, an old Western star named Lash LaRue, and his, his moniker was the master of the bullwhip. Well, sure enough, just, again, things happen for reasons, you know. Richard and I were talking one day. We had just gotten to Louisiana. We just started shooting. And he's and, and and something on the TV was on. I think it was a Western Lone Ranger or something like that. And I said, yeah, I met Clayton Moore at a convention. And, this, and he says, oh, my favorite was Lash LaRue. And I said, oh, the master of the bullwhip. And he said, how do you know that? I said, well, I'm a movie guy. It's what I know. Yeah. Ended up giving him like 25 different Lash LaRue movies on VHS tape so he could watch them in Louisiana and whatever. We all had v VCRs at that time. Yeah. Um, but... It opened me up to having conversations with him. And little did I know that, you know, he was on the other side after uh, him burning himself up. I knew about it, you know, but he wanted to be a teacher. Mm. And I just kind of stepped up as the student, even though that's not really how it started. Yeah. 
you know, we just started with conversations and friendship and okay, fine. And then it's asked me any question and I would just ask questions. And again, mentally, I was way ahead because since I was six years old, I, I spent more time with adults than the kids. Yeah. So it, he gave me perspectives on just about everything you could possibly imagine. Mm-hmm. So that is what really changed, you know, my life at that point. And then when I went through a, a tough period, you know, um, you know, he and I talked and he's like, you just got to kind of find the answer on your own. It's like this particular question. He's like, I can't really give you that answer because you have to find what you're looking for. You know, and I moved from California, went back to Jersey, was on the road for 17 months. But then I found the answer to the question, you know, and I talked to him in the meantime here and there, you know, and um, it uh it was it was amazing to have somebody who was so deep intellectually. The man knew I mean, you name something and he could tell you something about it. At the same time, he was a crack addict before that. You know, he loved his crack and he loved his coke and he was an alcoholic and did all the things he did and burned himself up and all that stuff. But man, there's been nobody that I would ever have wanted to be my teacher more than him, you know, because to, to, I can hear, I can still hear his voice. I think about it. I think of a question and I go, what would he say? And I can hear him. You know, I got to tell you, um, I, I will, I'll never forget the excitement that I had when I got hired, uh, for Grover Dill. And then I read the casting sheet and read Scott Schwartz and Peter Billingsley. Like I was, I was blown away that I was actually going to work with superstars. That That's what the first thing that came out of it. You guys are superstars because of the toy and because the dirt bike kid was my, one of my favorite, you know, movies back in those days because I loved dirt bikes. So it was it was an exciting time um, of meeting you guys and then learning about who you are and, and seeing your personality, like your personalities fit your characters like perfectly because you know, we could say that, you know, we, we were trained as actors, but it was all authentic. Like literally those characters that were in the movie were just brought out by Bob Clark pretty easily. It was just, it was a, it was a wonderful experience for me when I was a kid. But Bob, Bob guys. wanted, Bob wanted us to be natural. Yeah. hundred percent. That's what he, that's what he said more than anything else. He wanted a natural group of kids mm-hmm. to do this. Um, you know, I mean, the only one uh, that realistically I knew at the time was was Peter about yay much, you know. From what? From like uh, auditions or I something? Mean, and, you know, and, no, uh, no. From, uh, I think it's Real People. Oh, that's right. Or the show that he did. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. I mean, yes, I knew who Darren McGavin was. Yeah. Night Stalker. Sure. You know. Yeah. But I certainly didn't have... Uh, for some reason, I mean, I knew he was a night stalker and I just didn't talk to him about that. Yeah. It was, you know, and I really didn't have two long conversations with the guy. It was, Hey, it's nice to meet you. How you doing? Okay. Great. Uh, can you grab me a bagel? You know, uh, Melinda, <laughs> I knew more because of close encounters, you know, and enjoyed, uh, chit chatting with her a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, but I mean, I like I never said to her, oh, my God, you work with Steven Spielberg. Right. I didn't say that to her. Of course not. Yeah, that's not. A you know, I was more you worked with Richard Dreyfus. Mm. you know, mm-hmm. because he had done a film that I loved growing up uh, called The Competition. And it's a concert pianist movie with him and Amy Irving mm. and just always loved the movie. Yeah. You know, he thinks I'm nuts. Because <laughs> I met Dreyfus many times, he's like, "Seriously, you know?" I'm like, "Yeah." Um. So, uh, you know, outside of really that, I mean, Porky's had made the money, but for whatever reason, either I don't even remember if I had seen Porky's yet at that point. I probably did because my father and I saw we TSI R-rated picture on Forty Second Street, but probably didn't realize it was Bob. You know, at sure. the time. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, you know, everybody else was newbies, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just that's you got to start somewhere. Yeah, you do. Yeah, and it's happened. You know, I mean, I walked on a set. And when I walked on the toy, there was nobody there that went, oh, my God, that's the kid from that commercial. Right. <laughs> you know, no, of course not. Of course not. Yeah. You know, whereas I was going, oh, jeez, you know. Now, I mean, I'm in Richard Donner's office in California on 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 the lot, the Burbank lot. And, uh, you know, he's got a poster of Superman and the Omen. And I'm just like, oh, this is cool. Yeah, this is cool. Okay. Yeah. And I'm playing a pinball machine. He's got in his office. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. And then and then Dick Donner's like, uh, Scott, you got to stop for a second. If somebody here wants to see you. And I turn around as Richard Pryor. And I'm like, all right, this is cool. Okay. You know, hi, how you doing? You know. So it's like, you know, Richard would tell a joke and there'd be a word in there that, you know, it's a 13 year old kid, you know, really, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I laughed or we just went on with whatever we were talking about That's because I, I, it didn't matter to me. It wasn't something that meant anything. You know, now, you know, oh my God, you can't and you can't and you can't get, you know, I'm sitting on a set for four months with Richard Pryor and Jackie Gleason. You got, you have a literally five to seven pack a day smoker. Oh, wow. Who doesn't stop for anything? Gleason didn't stop for anything. Unfiltered red palm oils oh. all day, from the morning at, at makeup. I mean, we I would sit and we would talk it, and he'd be smoking away. I you know, he found a uh, he found a piece of the puzzle he he never had before with me. Sounds very str- strange, but I'll explain. He never had a way to keep people away from him on a set. Mm. Because if he just sat there, people would come up, oh, Mr. Gleason, oh, Mr. Gleason, oh, Mr. Gleason. One day he and I were chit-chatting, and I mean, I was tiny. I weighed 50 pounds when I was doing the toy. And he put me on his lap. He just put me on his left thigh, and I'm sitting there. Now, you got to realize, he's smoking away. I'm, I'm this far away from him, and he's just smoking away. But nobody came over to bother him. Nobody came over to talk to him. So he figured out, if I put the kid on my lap, nobody else will bother, nobody will bother us. <laughs> so it, it, once he did it once, then it was like pretty much almost every time we were on the set at one point or another, if we had downtime, he'd say, kid, come here. And he literally just picked me up, put me on his stick. How you, how's today going? You doing all right? You know, but we would, again, we would talk about old Hollywood stuff, but he'd be smoking away. You can't do that today. You can't smoke near a kid. You got enough problems smoking in the studio. Go outside, go across the street, take a boat to the other side of the island, smoke over there. You know. Back then, it didn't matter. Yeah, it didn't matter. That, no, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Yeah. You know. That's awesome. Uh, but I got, I got a chance to get an amazing education because I asked questions. Yeah. You know. You know, people are like, oh, well, what was it like being directed by Bob Clark? I've had that question. You know, I said, what was it like? Well, let's see. Bob said, okay, go do it. Do this. And, and I said, well, well what do you want me to do? Do what you do. If I don't like it, I'll tell you to change it. <laughs> okay. So I did it. It wasn't that he didn't like it. He just wanted me to exaggerate more of what I was doing. So I did that. He goes, nope, you did it right the first time. Go back to what you did. Okay, fine. That There's my directional... You know, objective from Bob Clark was mm-hmm. do what you do. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, Peter, I know, you know, got 98% of Bob because, of you know, the directional stuff because he wanted Ralphie to be done right, you mm-hmm. know. And I mean, Peter was spectacular, you know, whether it was Bob, whether it's Peter, it's still got to come out of you. Yeah. You know, yep. you can you can be explained how to do something every which way but loose, but unless you get it and you do it properly, you know, you, you're never going to get it. And I mean, to this day, it's like you know, we turned around and you know, we 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 brushed off the old uh, you know the old shoes and we got back into them again, and then we go out and we do it, you know, thirty nine years later, and you know, and I mean, you know, listen, it. it do you have regrets in life? Yeah. I wish you were in uh, Bulgaria, Bulgaria with us. I really do. Because, you know, we had fun. You would have had fun. You would have had to quit your job, but you would have had fun. Sure. Uh, that wouldn't have made it worth it. 
<laughs> you know, but but being there for 10 days and then the war in Ukraine broke out oh, and it's like, yeah. oh my God, and we're just freaking out. And you got, you know, you got basically two American stations, you know, you got CNN International and MTV. <laughs> That's pretty much your American stations in Bulgaria. Wow. Everything else is different language. Yeah. All right. Well, I've got one question uh, from John Demmer, which uh, actually John Demmer came uh, to the event in Cleveland. And this is John, John Denver. No, Demmer. D E M M E R. Oh, Demmer. I was going to start singing Calypso. It's like, okay, you know. Yeah. So take me home, country roads. Okay, go ahead. John has been on a mission to try to find out this answer because he is all about trying to find the little quirks and things about this movie to bring truth to it. So he said a rumor persists that it is a Flick's voice on the phone when Ralphie's mom calls Schwartz mom. The character no. getting spanked is supposed to be movie Schwartz, but who did the voice for that audio? Who was that? <sighs> so it was not you. No. No. Well, first of all, she doesn't call Flick's mother. She calls Schwartz's mother. Right. Yes. Okay, so it's not RD Schwartz either. Schwartz called Schwartz's mom. Um, oh, my God. I met the guy. Believe it or not, I was at the outlet center up in uh, Oxnard or Camarillo, whatever it was here. And the guy worked at a Sony, the Sony store. Okay. And I went in, I'm walking around, and he goes, excuse me, are you? And I said, yeah. He said, well, we kind of worked together, but we didn't. I said, really? You know, what was it? He said, well, I was the phone on the voice that voice got the, his ass whooped by uh, <laughs> Schwartz's mom. I did the voiceover for, uh, you know, whoever. He says, whoever the guy was that did Schwartz, you know, he was the, what, mom, what, 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 whatever. Uh Oh my, oh my god. god. That's, a, that's that's hilarious. Yeah, I think I talked to the guy once after that. And it was really funny because he was a New York kid. He came out of New York the same time frame we all did. And he was nice about it, but he's like, I have to tell you something. I absolutely despise you. <laughs> what what did I do? You know, what have, what have I done? He's like, because every time you walked in for an audition. I knew my ass was handed to me and I wasn't going to get it. It was going to be you because I was killing it. You know, I just had one two year stretch that it was just insanity. Back, back, I was booking back, 80% back. of the stuff I went up for. And I'm like, dude, I'm sorry. Back in the 80s. You know, do you make commission? I'm like, do you make commission? I'll buy something just because, <laughs> you know. Uh, but he was a nice guy. I wish I could remember his name. But he was in. Oxnard Ventura. Yeah, yeah. You know, and this has got to be, oh my God, it's got to be 20 plus years ago. Mm. But no, that's the answer to the question is, you know, yeah, I actually did meet the guy, but he wasn't one of us. Right on. You know, he just did the voiceover. All what right, so one last, one last question for you um, is, all right, so if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self, what would that look like? What would that be? And why? Invest in Microsoft. <laughs> Microsoft. What else? <laughs> Google, maybe. Google, maybe. <laughs> nope. Invest in Microsoft. Microsoft. Find find that guy named, named Mark who is from Boston with Facebook. Yeah, find that guy. Uh, give him a few dollars too, okay? Right. Um, <sighs> you know... I believe in fate and destiny and everything happens for a reason. So if I were to go back, would I really want to change anything, you know, other than maybe the financial situation? Because I just could have told my my younger self, hey, listen, this is where you got to do it. Just put the money in here until this point and then you're good. You know, you don't have to do anything else. Um, but career wise, you know, yeah, I, I probably after... Uh, Christmas story, I probably should have come out to LA, you know, for three to six months and try to, you know, about, you know, doing a pilot or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, that would have been one thing. Um, 
you know, again, I'm just, I'm thinking career wise, you know, I'm not really thinking, you know, on the, the personal level, because there are things that we all do that we wish we could change, you know, uh, I probably shouldn't have cheated on my high school sweetheart because this day it still haunts me, you know, never cheated on another girlfriend or my ex-wife for that matter. Um, that was a long time ago. Uh, still love that girl. Uh, let's see, you know, but she's in the past. What can I do? Um, you know, it's really hard to think of, you know, what would you have changed? You know, people said to me, oh, well, would you trade one movie for the other? And I'm like, okay, well, go ahead. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice? You tell me what, what you think. What, what advice would you give your younger self? I mean, because you got a lot, you got a lot of, you had a lot of support from mentors when you were a kid. So, I mean, well, yeah, but, but now what the things that I learned, yeah. my younger self would learn because if I'm going back, I'm going back in time, Yeah, you know, so he would be able to learn from Richard mm -hmm. like I did, Yeah, you know, so that those things would happen. It's the, uh, ancillary things that you do. You know, that you, you, again, it, it's just, it's just, it's a, a wild question. If it's career wise, was there a movie or something else I would have wanted to do? Not really. You know, I mean, geez, you know, I did three movies back to back to back, two of them, you know, I'm the star of one, I become an icon because of the second most famous tongue in the world. There you go. There you go. Uh, the friendships that I've had, you know, Barry Bond, Shaquille O'Neal, Sugar Ray Leonard, Julius, Julius Serving, I mean, Hulk Hogan, I mean, you know, these are 40 year friendships damn near in yeah. some cases, you know. Uh, so would I really want to change any of that? No, I probably would just have gone back and told my, my younger self, you know, uh, do this and this financially. And then when you get to this point, don't do this. Mm. you know, but that was more, you know, where I kind of went off the rails and just became a miserable person for, for a time. Mm. You know, I, I would, I would sort of help him with that so that he wouldn't have to go through what I went through, even though he's supposed to go through it because he's me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, there's been a lot of <coughs> child stars, that have good, you know, good memories, you know, good times. Some have had bad times, you know, again, we see what's going on, whatever. Yeah. Um, I was, I was fortunate. I was lucky. I worked with great people, with good people who treated me right and didn't do stupid things and didn't, you know, none of the wackiness, you know, Nickelodeon nonsense and any of that, right. you know, right. um, and I was advanced enough as a kid by that point. You know, again, 13, 14 years old, I was 22, 25 mentally, yeah. you know, and they helped me flourish uh, as, somewhat as an actor, more as a person. Yeah. You know, right. The life lessons you get. Sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, being taught how to do stand up by Richard Pryor, you, it's impossible to give my younger self that answer. Yeah. The amount of hours that we spent. You know, but, uh, you know, I, I, I would probably just leave him be for the most part, you know, I mean, I think I'm an okay guy, you know, I'm sure that there's somebody that doesn't like me and that's okay. You know, I, I, I've tried to do right by people, do good things by people, be a good person. You know, I, we've all been very fortunate to be a part of something. Yeah that's part of Americana, you know? Um, and it's not a matter of tarnishing it. It's not a matter of anything we're going to do reflects upon that, you know, that's there. It's, it's all done. You know, the work is done. The legacy is there. You know, that's not going to change. You know, it doesn't make any difference who we talk about, who we vote for, who we care about, the good things in life, the bad it's things, cemented. that's yeah. already there. It's there. That's for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Well, cool, man. That's amazing. So before before we wrap it up, 
Um, I do have. That's it. That's all the questions. That's it. That's the tough questions. Wait, it's, come it, on, dude. It, it... <laughs> That's all the tough questions we got for you today. We'll we'll pick up later. <laughs> you want another one? I think I got another one. Here, you know what? Here's another one. So, um, and this might be actually a, a a good one. So, the theme of friendship is central to a Christmas story. The theme of friendship. Uh, so, how has this theme played out in your personal relationships and life after the film? How has it played out? <clears throat> I mean, it's an interesting question. Again, I think it's all within us, each each of us, because we all have different personalities. You know, I mean, I have my friend David Wilbur. I've had him since kindergarten, for goodness sakes. My friend Kenny Overk, I've had since second grade. You know, he's the best man at my wedding. Man. Then he was the best man at my divorce, but that's beside the point. Um, but, you know, there's differences in people and things that you do or you don't do. Okay. As the oldest of us, I've always, I believe to have been more or less the ringleader. Because I'm always doing rope and every, hey, do you want to, hey, do you, we got the, you know. You do the family thing, you know, but outside of that, it's like, hey, we got to this, we got to that, okay, fine. Yes, you did Indiana. I'm not going to forget that. Okay. Um, but uh, everything is, it's, it's within each person. And it's not something you can teach somebody, you know. Yeah. It's not, it, you can tell somebody. You know, again, it's a Richard thing, you know. And he was, he explained it to me. My uncle just did it and I saw what he did. And I just always did it, but kind of Richard explained it to me. And he's like, if you want to hear some from somebody, you pick up the phone. You want to talk to him, you pick up the phone. Yeah. You want to know what's going on? Pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. You know. And he I mean he was around, you know, we were friends before cell phones. These things. Yeah. The phone was on the wall in the kitchen. Yeah. You know. You know, or you had the twenty foot cord in the bedroom. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um so I, I was just, I was the one that always picked up the phone and called and, hey, how you doing and what's going on and how you been? Not everybody's like that, yeah. you know. Um, people go through different things in their lives. Sometimes they want to talk about things. Sometimes they don't want to talk about things. Uh, you know, and sometimes getting asked that question can be upsetting. It's like, hey, how you been? What's going on? Well, and he, then they got to start explaining it. Uh -huh. And they don't necessarily want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want the truth or do you just want me to say everything is fine? It's been wonderful that we shared time as youngsters and ended up being in something that people wanted to see us to be together again. Right. Like that. That's, you know, it's like it's, there's only a couple of iconic films yeah. that are like that. Yeah, I mean, it's Willy Wonka, it's Porky's, you know, it's Animal Goonies, House. Right, yeah, right. Goonies, yeah, you know. But then you have different personalities and different careers and where have people gone and what right. have they done? Right. And can we pull it off, you know, and all this stuff? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Yeah. You know, um, so uh, it's been great, though, being able to spend time with people that, you did something with that impacted people's lives. You know, it, it, it made a difference. It was, I mean, realistically, it's a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know? <laughs> but it's become so embedded in people mm -hmm. and the fans that love it. They can't wait to watch 24 hours of it. Yeah. You know, that it's become a part of their life. It's wonderful. I'm not saying anything wrong with it. You know, better that than some of the other movies that are made, you know. Yeah. Um, but to be able to call a band of brothers brothers after 40 plus years. It's rare. You know, and we're yeah. all still around somehow. You know, we're all still walking and we're all still talking somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many casts of many other films where there's, you know, little pieces. I mean, we understand 
you know, God rest both of their souls, Melinda and Darren and Bob sure. and Gene, yeah. you know, I mean, I mean, from us, from, from the kids, sure. yeah. you know, and of course, yeah. you know, God bless her. Teach is still around. Teddy is still around and, yeah. you know, I'm probably, I'll probably see her sometime soon. I got to go up there. Before we, we wrap this up, I do have a crazy little game that I want to play with you. Okay. So <laughs> this game is called that triple dog there. Of course it is. Of course, it's called a triple dog there. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present you with a series of fun and hypothetical situations and scenarios. Um, and your job is pretty simple. You just have to let us know if you take the dare or just like Flick did with the flagpole or if you'd rather pass. It's really up to you. OK, so. OK, wait. So it's it's I can accept it. That this, can accept I can accept the dare, dare or you pass. Yes. OK. All right. Okay. So dare number one. First up, if you were Pass. dared, if you were, <laughs> if you were dared to have a karaoke battle singing Christmas carols against Peter Billingsley and the rest of the cast, would you take the dare or would you pass? I take. I would. I would take the dare. Yes, we would do that. Yes, we would. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Dare number two. All right, so next, imagine you're dared to recreate the flagpole scene, but this time as an adult with the latest social media platform live streaming the events. Do you triple dog dare you? You take that or do you pass? How much is the paycheck? Uh, how big ever you, ever you want it. Oh, for enough a paycheck? Sure, why not? I would do it, okay. absolutely. Okay, what if you would Considering... You Forget it. <laughs> no, no flagpole for you. <laughs> I think I've taken that picture less than five times in my life since then. You know, of, of sticking the tongue out on something like a pole. That's the only four or five times since 1983 You've done that. that I've 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 done the tongue on the flagpole. Thing. All right. So now, if Gene Simmons home. asked me to do it, I would do it for Gene. It, oh, so we've got we've got two opportunities. One either we can get. He's way too we much can money get though. Flick paid, <laughs> right? <laughs> What's this get flick paid? Because <laughs> yeah, where's the budget? And, it all went to Gene. Lose that battle too, though. I mean, you... so you're dared to wear the infamous pink bunny suit at a major public event, say throwing the first pitch at a baseball game or during the live TV interview. Would you embrace your inner flick and take the dare, or would you take a hard pass? <laughs> It's really more a Peter thing. Um, I, there would have to be a reason why I'm doing it. I'm not saying I wouldn't, but there would have to be a really damn good reason why. So what if Pete, what if Pete dared you? I know him better than that. <laughs> he wouldn't dare you? He would never put me in that position because he knows how the game is played. Because then... I would have something to say if I wanted him to just do something like that. And he it's would look to me like right? I'm from outer space. It's, exactly. Yeah, it's, you guys that would just it. never. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's not, again, it's just what's the situation? Why? You know, but I'm not saying it disgusts me and I'm not saying I wouldn't. I'm just saying the why. Dare number four. Remember the scene where Randy plays with his food, not wanting to eat his red cabbage. Well, if you were dared to eat an entire plate of red cabbage while pretending it's the most delicious meal you've ever had, would you take the dare? Nope. <laughs> hate red cabbage. Hard pass. <laughs> okay. No, easy pass. Now, easy if you pass. said mashed potatoes, yeah. uh, you said mashed potatoes, uh, that I would do. Oh, so mashed, mashed potatoes, potatoes I would do. I love mashed potatoes. <laughs> okay. Right on. All right. Dare number five. Sleep in the department store window with a leg lamp. So imagine being dared to spend the night sleeping in a department store window. Let's just say Macy's in New York, right beside the leg lamp as a live holiday display. Do you take the dare for an ultimate A or Christmas or uh, do you pass? I'm a native New Yorker. You know, I might, I, I might take that dare. I probably would. I don't really like the city much right now because the, the crime and what's going on, but mm. Macy's display window. It, can somebody bring me a couple of hot dogs? I you know and some hot chocolate. 
and and some and some dare no, devils. I don't, I don't want hot dogs. Devils. I, I just take a couple of dogs and. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that would be a thing of the past. Give me give me a kraut dog. I'm good. You know. We got him. Yes. All right. Cool. All right. Well. Um. So. Yeah. When am I going to New York? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Probably next week. Couple months. When? <laughs> Well, Scotty, man, it was um, it was a pleasure. I I appreciate you coming and hanging out, man, and having some fun and answer these these questions and just being just being with us again, um, being with me again because it's you know it's been since since the craziness that happened in in Indiana. I know you've been traveling a lot too, man. You got a lot a lot going on, so I just want to say thank you for taking the time out. Appreciate you. I love you very much, man. You too, brother. You, Everybody you. out there, be well, stay good, be healthy, enjoy life. L'chaim. Shalom, whatever. All of that good stuff, yes. All right, brother, we'll talk soon, okay? Love you, man. Before we wrap up today, I wanted to touch on something that always strikes me about A Christmas Story. It's the way that the film captures the essence of the holiday spirit. Hope, anticipation, the inevitable ups and downs, and ultimately the joy of being together. This movie isn't just a collection of funny scenes or memorable quotes. It's a mosaic of moments that reflect our own holiday experiences, whether it's the frenzied excitement of opening presents, the warmth of family gatherings, or even the occasional mishaps that become cherished moments. A Christmas Story invites us to see our own lives in the glow of its Christmas lights. It teaches us that perfection isn't what makes the holiday season special. It's the love, it is the community, it's family, and sometimes the sheer unpredictability of it all. And for those of us who hold this movie close to our hearts, there is a desire to keep that connection alive, to delve deeper into the stories behind the story, to understand more about the people who made it, and to find new ways to celebrate the magic it brings to our holiday traditions. This brings me to something truly special for everyone who's joined us today and feels that deep connection to A Christmas Story. Every morning, you can receive an email personally crafted by the beloved cast filled with behind the scenes tales, personal reflections, and little known facts about your favorite holiday classic. You can dive into the world of Ralphie, the leg lamp, the bumpuses, and through the eyes of those who brought them to life and keep this spirit of a Christmas story and Christmas alive every single day. Join the A Christmas Story family, connect with over 100,000 fans and the cast, united by love and laughter. It's your daily reminder that the magic of a Christmas story isn't just the holiday season, it's a feeling we can carry with us year round. So to everyone listening, from Scott and myself, thank you for tuning in and don't forget to subscribe to our Talking A Christmas Story Family newsletter at achristmasstoryfamily.com for your daily sprinkle of joy. This is Yano and Aya signing off. So stay connected, stay curious, and above all, my friends, stay kind. We'll see you on the next episode of Talking A Christmas Story. Well, yes, I forgot. But here it is the grand winner of the sweepstakes of the celebration from A Christmas Story's 40th anniversary year is... And this is what you're going to get. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, look at that. <gasps> Who is a grand prize winner? Who can it be? Oh my God. Well, are you guys ready? Drum roll, please. And the winner of the sweepstakes of the 40th anniversary year from a Christmas story is Holly Osborne. Holly, congratulations. Expect this in the mail shortly. Thank you. We love you guys and have a fantastic rest of your week. Bye. Oh my God, I shot my eye out. You'll shoot your eye out, kid.